Coming up next on the podcast, Alex, Caitlin, and I discuss Alex's exploration of Andrew Huberman's daily blueprint. He explained to explains to us what that is and why he was curious about it as a runner. Then we dive deep on the long run. We talk about what the long run is, what it's for, what its purpose is, how to make it interesting and fun, and how to execute in the long run and have success, especially as you go into your marathon build this summer for your fall marathon. All right, let's get into the show. Alex Sear and Caitlin Tossi, as always, we're going to talk about Alex's total life change. You, you've, you've adopted a new, not, a, not just a new way of running, but a new way of being. We're going to break down uh, Alex's exploration into Andrew Huberman's uh, daily blueprint on how to live your life more effectively, more healthfully. And then we're going to pivot to Caitlin picking her brain on what is the long run and how to do it correctly as we're just about to jump right into marathon training season for the fall, uh, for fall marathon. So we thought we would, we would talk about what the purpose of the long run is and what, what, what is a long run guys, what defines a long run? Uh, and we can get into that. That's their second topic of the day, but first guys, uh, what's going on, Alex, I, a little birdie told me that you're running again. If for those of you who don't know, Alex is uh, the perennially injured and has been coming back from a, an injury. Uh, hence the Andrew Huberman save my life topic that we're about to get into. But uh, how you feeling, man? Are you running? Mm, perennially injured and sometimes peronially injured. If you get the tender joke. <laughs> All right. Oh, Started on a high note. Let's go. I'm actually back. Yes. I'm, I'm, running i'm doing walk runs actually i graduated from the walk runs yesterday i had my first full 30 minute run and i gotta say so i've left little hints here and there and previous podcasts talked about coaching and i've actually hired a coach for the first time in a really long time and this is a different this is a different approach to coming back from running i think when left to my own devices i would come back pretty quickly and ramp up to near full mileage in six weeks. This has been a lot slower. I think I've had about three weeks of walk running and now I'm just back to full runs and I'm trusting it. You know, the, the good part about having a coach is you don't question what you should do. And uh, even though the buildup is slower, I just, I have faith in it and it's taken off a whole lot of stress. So different, different type of experience, enjoying it so far. And yeah, I have no pain. So Ah, that was my question. Do you have pain? No, then you're on the no right pain. track. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So no, I'm happy. I'm happy with my coach. Not just saying this because I'm pretty sure he listens to this podcast. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great. The, and everything is starting off on such a positive foot. That's so good. Yeah. Shout out to our friend, John LaFranco. Uh, I'm pals with John as well. We've, I've, I've edited John's work in the past as a writer. He's an excellent coach uh, high, high recommend, uh, and a great person as well. So that's a good match. That's a good pairing. Hopefully, uh, hopefully you don't like awkwardly break up down the road and put me in the middle as like the, the weird, <laughs> the weird child in the middle of the divorce, the weird orphan friend. Yeah. I didn't want it. I, I didn't know if you wanted the name drop, but yeah, I'll proudly mention John, take me to the half marathon. <laughs> <laughs> nice. The promised land. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And Caitlin, how are the beautiful trails of Costa Rica? Um, or are they the stiflingly, murderously hot trails of Costa Rica right <laughs> no, now? No, no. It's been oh, it's been so great after the marathon to get back to trail running because I did take that marathon super seriously. So I literally was only hitting the trails with the training club maybe twice a month and for like an hour at a time. So now I'm back full time, even running trail during the week on the weekends, the trail long runs, just like having a really great time. So it's been so nice to be back in the mountains and now preparing for, um, a trail race in July. Yeah. Ooh. It'd be great. I, I think one of the mysteries of, of trail, especially trail ultra runners, for those of us who, uh, stick to the roads primarily is 
just how much you run on a daily basis. So like you ran this morning slash the middle of the night. Cause we know, <laughs> we know now that you start at like some ungodly hour every morning yes, to beat the heat. It's true. Like what, what was this morning's run like? No, like this morning was and... only, was only an hour. I think, okay. really, I think between Monday through Thursday, it's usually about an hour, hour and 20 minutes for longer speed work. You know, I still run during the week on the road for the most part. Usually I'll take like one of my recovery runs on a Wednesday and I'll take advantage of it and I'll go to the trails. And then Friday, Saturday, we do, you know, the back to back long run, or I think most people would probably do it on a Saturday, Sunday. I do it Friday, Saturday. So Friday will be mountain long run, which will probably be, I think it's this week it's two hours on Saturday and I run like three, three and a half hours on, on uh, Sunday. Yeah. Friday and Saturday, two hours, Friday, three hours on Saturday. Yeah. So. That's a lot. That's it's a, a lot. lot. Oh. The three, three and a half hours in the mountains, especially coming right off of a, a two hour session the day before. I mean, that's, that's impressive. That's a lot. Uh, well, remember though, we take it a lot easier than road runners. So you have to think, you know, take that into consideration too. It's not like I'm pounding out on the pavement, you know, really hard miles. So it's also at a much like easier pace, conversation pace most of the time. And, you know, we're walking too, especially with the steep inclines we have here in Costa Rica, there's no way you can run all of the hills here. So you get those walk breaks. So the mileage isn't, isn't as high. You don't think like, Oh, three and a half hours to run 35 kilometers. No, 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 no. Probably, you know, 25, 30, who knows? It, it depends on the terrain, but it's a bit easier on the body. So guys, do you know what Friday is this Friday? We're recording this Wednesday afternoon, uh, June 19th, Friday, June. the 21st of June. It's uh, it's solstice longest day of the yes. year. Yes. Oh. Is that the answer you were looking for? That's the primary answer. The secondary answer is it's my birthday. I, I was going to say your birthday. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I have in the past done crazy shit on my birthday, not crazy, crazy shit, but like fun running feats, you know, like it's your birthday. It's on the solstice. It's the longest day of the year. It's kind of a neat opportunity, right? Lots of sunlight. Yeah. So this year, uh, I got a couple of, a couple of running pals sort of ping me last minute and we're like, we're going to go and do this pretty gnarly 80 ish kilometer loop uh, in called the Killarney. It's called the Clush. It's in Killarney, uh, provincial park in Ontario in Canada. It's in like rural it's a four or five hour drive North of Toronto. We're going to hit it on Friday. We're going to go Thursday night, camp out at the, at the trailhead, then hit the, the loop and get it done in one day on Friday on the longest day of the year. Do you wow. want to come? And I was like, hell yeah. I so want to come. <laughs> so like, I'm turning into an ultra runner on Friday, yes, guys. That's awesome. Slash ultra walker, because that's probably going to be most of it. But. Do you think this is like a weird surprise party for you, Michael? Or it's like some sort of intervention where they're like, you know, I, we get halfway through and they're like, Michael, you're now you're 44 years old. It's time to drop this like chase for the PR. You got to let it go, man. No more <laughs> marathon PRs. You're done. You're over the hill. This is your future. <laughs> running could, on the trails really slowly could you imagine could you imagine that they take you there and they throw you this like amazing surprise party that they had planned and then you're disappointed because you wanted to do the 80k yeah no i would, I would be like <laughs> thank no god <laughs> yes I'll, i'm just gonna eat steak and drink yeah. beer instead yeah, yeah. No, no i uh <laughs> I bought a shitload of Morton, so I mean, okay. I guess I could save that for the fall marathon. But yeah, I'm gonna consume so much, so much. Uh, what is that? Danish nutrition engineering hydrogel. I'm gonna, I'm gonna suck that stuff back on Friday. Uh, <laughs> we'll see how it goes. And also, this is a little teaser to our friends at Apple. Shout out to you guys. We're gonna get to find out if the Apple Watch Ultra Two can survive. Oh. An all-day ultra experience in the trails. So uh, I may have to write something about that. I may even have to make a video on that. That that. Mm. So I'm actually bringing the. I'm bringing. The, I'm, this is how depraved I am. I'm bringing the <laughs> Apple Watch charger and a power brick just in case the watch gets really low on power, and I'm gonna like charge it while it's on my wrist or something while I'm running. Um, just because I want to see what the I want to see the the data at the end. I think it'll be an interesting. It's an interesting. Uh, it's an interesting experience for sure. 
Oh, it's yeah. going to be fun. Have fun. Yeah. Yeah. I'll report back next week. Yep. All right. Speaking of life changing endeavors, let's pivot into our first topic of the week. So Alex, you've made, I've seen, I've seen the preview cause I've, I've seen the rough drafts. You've made a video that's dropping. It'll be out. It'll be available Thursday morning. So it'll be available by the time you listen to this podcast, it'll be on our YouTube channel. It's like a, a video essay entitled what Alex? It's can Andrew Huberman make me a better runner? Okay. For all of us who are not, you know, deeply online and podcast fanatics, who is Andrew Huberman? Hmm. So Andrew Huberman is a podcaster, primarily a neuroscientist who has been, maybe still is affiliated with Stanford University. You might have seen his face, his big shoulders, his big beard around the internet. He's become quite famous because he's really good at talking about scientific, usually complicated concepts and distilling them down, sometimes in periods of like three hours with guests who are pretty well known in the podcasting world. So for the podcasters, you know, it's the the Joe Rogans, the Rich Rolls, the Tim Ferrises, those names, the Jocko Willink that circulate around the like weird, weird edge between bro podcasting and health and fitness podcasting, Peter Atia, you know, these 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 people. Huberman became, I think, really famous around 2020, 2021, because the stuff that he talks about is actually, I always found to be pretty actionable and useful. He doesn't talk about weird fads, weird diets. It's basically just like little lifestyle tips and tools that you can integrate into your life to live a little bit more healthy, get better sleep, and just feel a little bit more like yourself. So that kind of stuff always resonated with me. You know, things like, you know, wake up early, go for a walk, simple things that I could implement. And so recently, I decided to implement it into my life because I thought it might help me be healthier and avoid injuries. So that that's what spurred me onto it. And so he's got this thing called the daily bl- blueprint. Um, why was it intriguing for you? And, and when did you first implement it? So I think it, okay. It became interesting to me last year when I, I got injured, like, Yeah. The last few years I've had, you know, three months of health, two months of injuries. And after like five or six revolutions of this, I thought, you know what, maybe I should do more than just keep going to physiotherapy and, and running slower on my easy runs and perhaps taking the training down. Maybe it's something else. And I wondered if it, if reducing my stress levels and trying to improve and fix my sleep might help. And so I gave it a try. I actually did a story about it for a publication back in, I think, last fall. And so that made me just follow his daily blueprint every day for, I think, about a month. And uh, and I saw some changes. So do you want me to take you through the blueprint itself? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Let's go. So um, start, I guess, what is it? Start when you wake up? Is it start in the morning? Yeah, it's like it's like three phases. So you wake up in the morning and you try to wake up at the same time every morning. So for me, it was like six, six thirty. I tend to wake up early, but there's no like crazy wake up time. It's just try to wake up naturally. The one thing he says is try to keep it consistent on a daily basis. Don't try to go to sleep at a bunch of different times, waking up at different times. As soon as you wake up, you go for a 30 minute walk. You come back. You do a little cycle of breath work, like meditation, which isn't something I'd really done before. So that took some getting used to. It's about five minutes, just deep inhales and exhales. And then wait 90 minutes before drinking your coffee. So it's all little things like that. And the reason is that it will act on your, your system, on your brain, on your chemistry so that you don't crash in the afternoon and also to try to facilitate a better sleep the night coming. So that's the morning. Try to drink, I think one liter of water. So that would be, you know, two standard bottles of water. And then you get into phase two, which is lunch. In lunch, you try to have a low carb lunch, which isn't what we're used to around here. Like usually we'll have a big plate of rice, a whole lot of pasta, a little bit of meat and vegetables. I tried to regulate that to have that a bit more balanced. I think there's a second walk. There's a second walk after lunch, 15 minutes. And then that's meant to avoid the afternoon crash. 
then you exercise either first thing in the morning. For me, I exercise at usually 4, 5 p.m. That's what works best in my work day. Get into dinner. Dinner is supposed to be complex carbs, protein, because that takes a longer time to digest, helps you sleep at night. Then you get into the night phase, which is try to get the temperature a little bit lower in your house or at least in your room. Try to sleep in a dark room. Don't look at your phone, TV screens for the hour before bed. Supposedly that helps you sleep better and then repeat the thing the next day. So nothing wild, pretty intuitive, but a lot of steps. So you do have to be intentional about it at first. And yeah, I followed, I followed it religiously for like a month. And now, you know, I've, I've slipped a little bit. I, I, I implement them a little bit more like casually on the day to day. What's the first thing that slips? The first thing that slips, I think, is food. Mm. Food. Um, I'm not a chef. I'll often eat like what's around, sometimes leftovers. Sometimes I won't think that much about like, okay, I need a balanced lunch with low carbs. Like it's possible that I'll just slam some sushi, which is pretty high carb. Um, yeah, I think it was my lunches because dinner, then you have a little bit more time to prepare things. Um, oh, and the breath work because, because it's never, that never was part of my actual routine walks in the morning. I still do religiously because I actually enjoy it, but the, the meditation has, has slipped completely. What breath. Tell us about the breath work, Alex. <laughs> the breath work is you do five minutes, right? So after a walk, you sit there, then you do 25 inhales and exhale. It's super simple. Like it's, it's very easy. You just have to take the time to do it. Yeah. And then so like, yeah. So like for somebody who's never done breath work before, um, I guess this is sort of like a, it's almost like a little miniature take on not quite meditation, but it's kind of a, a centering, uh, tactic, I guess. Like, can you give us like, Caitlin, do we want to see him do some breath work? I think I'm, we kind of want to, we want to see here right now. This is like the weirdest podcasting ever, ever but <laughs> it's like, if you're listening right now, you're going to, you're going to be like, okay, I'm going to hear a guy breathe. This is going to be <laughs> unusual for a podcast, but like, what's it like? Give us some breath, give us some breaths. You're going to give you okay, a couple. Well, it'll be more interesting if I do the psychological sigh. So at the start okay. of the day, it's just breath work. It's, it's inhale, exhale. That's it. Repeat, repeat, repeat. Apologies to the listeners. Now, the, okay. the, the psychological sigh, psychological sigh is, is a little bit different. You start with an inhale, big inhale. So, and then when you're at the top, you're supposed to hold your breath in and then do a second top up inhale. So at, at this point, your lungs are very full. You'd be talking like this. <laughs> And then you completely exhale everything, empty the lungs. So Repeat that a three times. So okay. you've got a partner, you're like, do you do this like lying in bed just before you fall asleep? Yeah. Yeah. My girlfriend thinks I'm really stressed about something and I'm like, it's the opposite. I'm so zen right now. <laughs> I'm de-stressing. <laughs> exactly. Alex, I have a question about the morning walk. Um, mm -hmm. is it, does it all, cause I know that the morning walk has to do with sunlight as well. Like getting that, those sun first rays in the morning, does mm -hmm. it have to be, is there a specific reason why it has to be a walk or could that also be your run? If you're someone like me and I run in the middle of the night, as Michael says, or could that be my, cause at four 30 here, actually the sun is, is coming out half of the year. So does it count if it's a run or does it have to be a walk? Doesn't have to be a walk. Great oh, question. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So Huberman's <laughs> Huberman's thing is that there are two great times to work out in the day. I I did 4 p.m. because that was already a part of my day. But early in the morning is also great because you get that same benefit of looking like getting sunlight early on in the day. The whole point of getting sunlight early on, it, the way I understand it, is that it regulates your circadian rhythms. Right. The more that you can train your body to be up and looking at light early, the easier it will be for your body to like get tired on the other end of things. So 10 PM hits and you're naturally drowsy as opposed to trying to make yourself tired because you slept in until 11 AM and you didn't see any sunlight all day. But when you go for a run, the same thing happens. And also the other thing is between the, the reasons that those two times are, are good for working out early in the morning and also late in the afternoon is that they're not right after a meal, which like you mm -hmm. just know intuitively feels uncomfortable to run right after a meal. Yeah. 
Yep. And also aren't right before bed because it's hard to, to, to regulate yourself down and wind down after hard exercise. So totally. I mean, the challenge for you is to wait until the sun comes up. <laughs> Great. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. It does. Half the year, 4.30 a.m., you start seeing the sun. And then in the summer here, which is December, January, that's when the sun rises late, which is like 5 a.m. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you that one of the coolest runs I ever did was on the other side of the world from where you are, because you're in Costa Rica, in Reykjavik, Iceland, in May, because the days in May in Reykjavik are very long. The sun wow. comes up at 4.30 in the morning and then goes down at, at midnight. And But but the Icelanders are not up at 4.30, right? Why would they be? Their right. work day starts at 8.00. But when I got there, I was a bit jet lagged and I woke up with the sun and I had a run to do that day. So I, I ran through Reykjavik in the broad daylight at 4.45 a.m. with not a soul around. Wow, that's so cool. <laughs> and it was really neat. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think that if if you want to have like a very basic, fun, like weird phenomenological experience as a runner, like... Go out at some weird time of the day and just go for a run. Go run in the middle of the night once, just as a challenge. That sort of, as long as it's safe, of course. But yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so, so you've you've fallen off the uh, you've you've fallen off the Huberman wagon a little bit here. <laughs> you admit the breath work has has slid. Uh, how about the coffee thing? The coffee thing for me is it's such a small thing, but it's kind of a, a it's sort of a profound thing at the same time, right? Mm -hmm. I, I know for a fact that I've only gone without coffee for one 24 hour period once in my entire adult life, because I challenged myself to do it a couple of years ago just to see what would happen. Mm -hmm. Uh, what happened? Yeah. Uh, it, it, I didn't feel good. I'm going to, yeah, it wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be, but, um, you know, headachey, you just feel a bit off. Uh, caffeine's a powerful drug, right? And if you're drinking a couple of cups of coffee, you got the, the caffeine drip every morning for every day of your entire adult life. Uh, you're it's, I imagine it kind of alters the brain chemistry a little bit. So, mm. so in your case, I mean, it's not like you don't have to remove caffeine, but there's a really specific reason for pushing the coffee back. And is that something you've, you've, you've kept with, or are you allowed to were you, no, you were not allowed to caffeine dope because you weren't running first thing in the morning, right? That's it. Yeah, I, I can't remember if we mentioned that, but if you're running first thing in the morning, you can have caffeine right before the run. That's a that's a Huberman stipulation, I guess. Mm -hmm. I, I, what I did with Huberman, and I think we do this with a lot of things, training plans, work schedules, whatever, is I think we're we're naturally lazy. We try to see how much we can get away with in life. Like if... <laughs> If you know, think of a summer job that you would have had and, and your boss said, okay, you, you need to do all this and you need to fill the spreadsheet to, to just let us know everything you did. Well, that spreadsheet's not going to get filled, right? Because it's, it's extra. We try to get away with as much as we can. So I did the same thing with the Huberman plan. And so I, I removed the breath work somewhat subconsciously. And I kept everything else because I felt like I needed it. I actually felt like it made me feel good. So the coffee I'm still doing, the morning walks I still do, the nights get to me because and this is the dark side, I think, of any type of blueprint or plan, even one as non-invasive as this one. I think this one's pretty simple, is that when you fall off a little bit, you start to feel guilty and, and to think about it. So if 10.30 p.m. hits and I'm still scrolling on my phone, I realize, oh, you know, I messed it up. Uh, my sleep's going to suck and tomorrow is going to suck and all of that. But here's another thing I admire about the Huberman plan is that there's a guardrail against that. Like he, he puts right in his blueprint. He says, the goal here is to follow this at around 85%. You will miss some steps. You won't nail this every time. And I think that's a really good human approach because the goal is not to adhere perfectly to these things. And you got to know that it's okay if you miss one. Cause you don't want to fall off the wagon if you just had a bad day. So, so I'd say right now I'm probably doing 80 to 85% of it still. I also think that it's probably like suggested, uh, you know, you try everything out and then you pick and choose to see which factors actually really help you. 
uh, mm-hmm. specifically. So I don't think, you know, the whole schedule may be right for you, but maybe you said, oh, okay, no, that morning walk or the sunlight or shutting my uh, phone off and my computer screen down an hour before really, really helped me. So those things I'm going to make sure I always do. And then, you know, some things maybe just didn't really work for you, didn't make a, a big difference. And so, you know, some mm-hmm. things you can kind of weed out as you go along. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And another part of it is it, it makes you feel like you're kind of on a weird mission. And in my situation then, because I was injured and was waiting to get back into running, I felt like I needed that in my day, a type of structure, type of goal to hit. So that, yeah, that, that's all also great. Like if you feel like you just want to achieve something that's very achievable, put that in and that'll snowball into something else. That's a really great point. Yeah. I mean, that's one of the thing, things that's so attractive about being a runner, right? Is that you have this, you're on this little mini mission every day and, yep. or on a weekly basis or, or in a training plan context, if you've got a goal. And I guess this is kind of a, a version of that as well. That's a really good point, Alex. I think the one thing I'm attracted to with this is kind of cleaning up the end of the day stuff, the sleep, the, the, mm. the, the inevitable march towards bedtime. And I'm definitely guilty of being a person that doesn't want to think the day ever ends and trying to like stuff, uh, stuff 10 pounds of, 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 of shit into a five pound bag (laughs) at the last part in the end stages of the day. Um, and then you find yourself, it's like 1130 and you're still sitting in front of a, a laptop in your office or whatever. And, and that's just not good for your brain. And, and all this stuff is obviously is like a, whatever you think of Andrew Huberman as a person, because there was a pretty uh, entertaining expose of the man himself in New York magazine a couple months ago, which I recommend everyone read. You get to see the, the, the full, the full cloth of this person. Um, But what he's saying here, Alex is it's, it's pretty standard stuff and it's like kind of evolutionary biology stuff. It's like, you know, we're human animals and this is all human animal programming, right? Like we need to eat a certain way. We need to shut down at a certain point. We need to recover and repair and sleep for the next day. And then it's good to kind of keep things on a nice tight circadian rhythm, right? Um, Mm -hmm. Stop trying to fight time and the Mm -hmm. phone stuff. The phone shit is like the real, I think for me, it's so tempting to take your phone into bed and to stare at your phone for 20 or 30 minutes before bedtime. And that's yeah. not good for you. We all know it's not good for our brains. We all know we get lesser sleep because of it. Yeah. Uh, I think I'm that's becoming, what I'm going to try to adopt. The phone thing. Yeah. I'm becoming paranoid about the whole phone stuff because I, you know, now I've, I, I've been a, a big phone user for what, like 10 years, like everybody else now. And I, I think I'm noticing things in myself that are changing. You know, it's a cliche that we talk about attention span, but mm-hmm. it, it is, you know, Sometimes I wonder if I'm as good at holding a long conversation or focusing on something that that's long in, you know, I did a long magazine feature in the last couple of months. And by the end, I got so bored with it because, you know, I don't want to work on one thing, one story for three, four or five months, which so not used to that when 10 years ago, I think that would have been easy for me. Anyway, this is, this is digressing, but also <laughs> I think. I think these, these like back to basics, human biology type methods or fads or diets or whatever you want to call them are worth a look if they're simple and they don't cost anything because they do bring us back to a bit of a simpler time. And I'm a fan of that. You're here. And so you can watch Alex's YouTube video. It's like a video essay on our YouTube channel. You can just search marathon handbook in YouTube and you'll find our channel be sure to subscribe, be sure to watch Alex's video and give it a like. Cause it, it's great. It's really good. It's really fun and uh, very insightful. All right, guys, speaking of things that take a long period of time <laughs> and require a lot of concentration and maybe a, quite a bit of suffering as well. Let's talk long runs. Let's we're in, we're about to enter the, the, the endless summer of long runs uh, where you got to pack in, your Saturday or your Sunday long run once a week. It's like going to running church every weekend. (laughs) And uh, it's a huge component of particularly long run uh, marathon training and and half marathon training to a degree as well, especially if you want to run a fast half marathon. 
we're about to get into long run season, Caitlin. Um, first of all, like, I guess let's, let's start at the, the most like obvious, but also kind of opaque questions about the long run. Like a, what do you categorize as a long run? We'll start with that. Like I won't front load questions for you, but okay. What do you categorize as a long run? What's a, what is a long run to you? I mean, to me, the long run is your longest run of the week where that's where you're focusing mostly on your race distance goal. So you want to start building your endurance. And so your longest run, I think most of us, of course, that's generalizing because some people may have different schedules, work schedules, and they do long runs during the week. But most of us who have our usual Monday through Friday schedule, usually a long run on a Saturday or a long run on a Sunday. And that's most likely going to be your longest mileage or time of that particular week. And so like when you set out to do a long run, I, I always like to ask the question to myself before I step outside, like, what's the purpose of this run? Yeah. Yep. It's like a kind of a fundamental question, right? <laughs> yes. And we don't ask ourselves often enough. And I started doing <laughs> yeah. it a few years ago. And it's like, what's the purpose of this? Why yep. am I doing this? You know? And so the long run, besides the like, you have to do it if you want to run yep. a good marathon. Like, what is the, what's, what's your, as a coach, what's the objective yep. of a long run and, and the benefits of it? That's a, that's a super important question. And I think that all runners should kind of ask themselves, not just for long runs, but for all of their runs or all of their workouts, what's the point of this one? What's the objective? And, you know, if you have a coach, you ask your coach so they can really fill you in on why you're doing each component. The long run to me, they're truly three important objectives. Okay. Number one is that, that it's your, your longest run of the week. It's going to build your endurance, increase your physical, also mental like capacity to be able to endure that distance. Cause we also have to think that it's not just physical. You also have to mentally be able to get through long distances. So building endurance in general and adapting your body to all that time on your feet and your mind as well, uh, is really important. Number one, the second objective to me is for more advanced runners or experienced runners who actually have time-based goals. Um, I feel that's where you want to work on your race pace. And there are a ton of different coaches that have a ton of different methods. Some coaches don't use race pace in long runs. I do use race pace in long runs because I feel that's where you'll get the biggest boost of confidence. We're going to talk about long run variations um, a little bit later, so I'm not going to get too into it right now, but I feel like it can help you get ready to maintain your race pace. And the third objective is super important that long runs, especially your longest long run, which will probably end up being two to three weeks before your race, your peak is that they are dress rehearsals for your races. So super, super important. We're not just talking about building volume and, and, you know, working on your race pace. We're talking about practicing everything you're going to do on race day during those long runs. So What's your fueling strategy? What's your hydration strategy? What shoes are you going to use? What clothes are you going to use? How are you going to prevent yourself from chafing? How, absolutely everything that's going to be key for your race, you're going to practice in your long run. So think of them also as dress rehearsals and take advantage of everyone to practice everything you can to perfect your strategies as, as well as possible. Yeah. I like to like, I'll put on the full kit. I mean, yeah. I don't, I don't often run in a singlet unless it's really, really hot out, but I will sometimes test out the singlet I'm going to wear on, on race day. If I'm going to wear a singlet for, uh, for a marathon in particular. And, uh, cause, yeah, cause you want to check out all the little details. Cause like one thing you don't, I, I forget unless I'm wearing a singlet is like a singlet chafes. It's a yep. good thing to know that it's a mm -hmm. good little thing to practice. Better make better off making that mistake in the run in the long run than in the, in the marathon. Also like exactly. Testing out the shoes, especially if they're like newer shoes, you know, if you've invested some, uh, some cash into the super shoe and maybe they're fresh cause you want to keep them nice and, uh, nice and responsive to get that, that edge on race day, you can run in them. I'd say a couple of times beforehand yeah. just to break them in a bit and also get that feel for what it's like to run them at, at race pace. So you mentioned before, like doing a bit of work in a long run, not just kind of dragging yourself through 20 miles or two and a half, three, three hours or whatever. Um, but yeah, what are some other creative ways to, to spice up a long run? Because yeah, you know, like, let's face it, you know, <laughs> doing one every week can be pretty friggin' boring, right? Yeah. So. <laughs> Unless you've got some like, I don't know, great music playlist and you love listening to music or a podcast. Or some class, guy from Canada breathing your ear. Yeah, that's right. That's oh. right. 
Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Exactly. So unless, <laughs> unless that doesn't bore you, I mean, yeah, the LSD runs, right? The long, 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 slow distance runs. Guys, I saw your face, Michael. Um, they're the most common, right? And to be honest, most of our runs are going to be at an easy conversation pace. So we're talking rate of perceived exertion, three to four, uh, go along with someone, talk to them as you're running, build your endurance. Those runs are great for that. But as Michael said, sometimes they get a little bit, and it's not just that they get boring or tiring. It's not because of that. You can work on other objectives in your long runs. So it will depend on the cycle you're at in your marathon training. So, um, a fast finish long run is one of my favorites because they're freaking hard. <laughs> like you're running at an easy pace for most, the bulk of your long run. And then you have to like turn up the gas at the end for the last 5k and try to run those last 5k or last 3k or whatever it's going to be hard. And I would even say, you know, m your marathon pace is going to feel hard at the end of a long run but a tempo a threshold pace is going to feel harder. So if it's a fast finish long run and you're doing the bulk of it slowly, why not try to kick up the, the last three to five kilometers or so hard at your threshold pace? And I'm going to tell you, you're going to think, oh, but it's only 3K. Or it's only 4K in threshold pace. But let me tell you, after you've got 20 kilometers under your feet, it is not easy to ramp up to threshold pace. So that's something that I think is is, is hard to do. And it's really helpful for finishing off races, you know, with a boost. And a similar one is one that actually Alex said that, it, uh, Alex, you said that that was your favorite kind of workout was the progression, mm. the progression run. So instead of just doing that last chunk, right, we can follow what Alex was doing with his long run where started out slower. It's like almost doing negative splits in a race. So you start out easy and then you can break it up into as many bouts as you want. So if you want to do every 5k, I'm going to make a change every 3k, I'm going to make a change and kind of like dial it up little by little. So you'll start maybe with your warm up, and then you'll go to your easy pace and then you might want to go to marathon pace and threshold pace. And so, you know, you can dial it up as you go and then you'll end up finishing faster as well. And those are really entertaining because you've got to be paying attention to your distance and then paying attention to your speed. And it almost is like an interval workout, right? It is an interval workout. So it'll be interesting and fun and hard <laughs> and you'll progressively get faster as you go along. And I think maybe the last one that I feel is super important for those more experienced runners trying to get that, that time are the race pace intervals. So, I mean, you know, you can start, you can do it time-based, you can do it mile-based, kilometer-based, and just switch back and forth. So say I'm going to do two kilometers in easy pace and one kilometer in marathon pace, and I'm going to repeat that for my total mileage. Or, and as I get closer to my marathon, maybe I've, I've even gone up to like 7K in my marathon pace and then take, you know, a 3K break in an easy run and then 7K in a marathon pace. And it is hard but it's really, really hard. If you're really fighting for a time, marathon pace is not going to feel easy. So it's hard, but it kind of also brings you to reality and says, okay, this is going to feel really, really hard. Do I have, can I do this for 42K? Has that happened to you, guys, to you, Michael? Oh, my God, yes. <laughs> that, I mean, that happens every season. And I, uh, I don't think that doesn't happen when I'm doing or attempting marathon pace in a long run. I would say that like a real good pro tip is when you're doing marathon pace in a long run, especially if you're, you've got a time-based goal and especially if it's late into your training cycle, like don't be too hard on yourself. Don't give up on it. And it's going to feel hard. It's going to feel a heck of a lot harder than marathon pace will feel on race day. Cause you have to keep in mind, it's like, you're running that long run at the back of probably a pretty long week where you've done pretty big volume. You maybe you've run every single day. You've done a workout that week. You did a long run the week before. You've probably not taken many breaks along the way for several weeks on end. So you're hitting that with a lot of fatigue. And that's a good thing because you're training in that endurance with fatigue. Because when you're running a marathon, you're going to be tired in the second half. You're going to get fatigued in the last 10K for sure. Like the old adage is, is the marathon, the real race starts at 20 miles, right? So, <laughs> right. So it's not, it's totally cool to be feeling like absolute garbage while you're trying <laughs> to fight your way through a marathon pace. Yep. Um, but obviously if like your heart rate's super duper high, or if you're, you're really failing at holding that pace for any sustained amount of time, like 
it's probably conditions or maybe you're maybe you're too fatigued or maybe your marathon pace is is a dream more than a reality but ultimately i'd say overall yeah like it's it's going to feel a heck of a lot harder than it will after you're tapered and carb loaded totally all ready to go on race day <laughs> for sure so um one question that gets asked that I get asked a lot, particularly from newer runners or those trying to run the marathon for the first time. And I'm curious to hear what you guys think because I have my own opinions on this, but <laughs> splitting the long run, the, I can't, I can't fit in the full 30, whatever kilometers on Sunday. Can I just do like 12 and 20 or can I like, can I, can I hack it up? Can I dice it up somehow? What's your, uh, Coach Caitlin, what's your opinion on that? Yeah, I mean, especially for a marathon, I wouldn't recommend it. I wouldn't recommend splitting up your long runs because you're you're missing the point of the long run, right? Like if you're splitting it up, then you're doing either a distance run or just working on some, I don't know, because you're not doing speed work most likely. You're going to end up splitting up just your longest volume run into two different pieces. And I wouldn't recommend it if you don't have to do that because you're really going to miss out on all the benefits. You're going to miss out on the endurance building. You're going to miss out on the dress rehearsal for the race, which is super important. Now, if once or twice, like absolutely not for the peak run or any longer run for that matter. But if you're in the middle or the beginning of your season and you have a day where you're like, I've got to take my kid to this birthday party and then I have to do this and then I have to do that. And you're either not going to run or you're going to split it up. I would say, will run because some running is better than no running. But, um, but yeah, I, I, I definitely wouldn't recommend it if you don't have to, because it kind of defeats the purpose. I, I bet you're kind of on, on uh, the same, right. On, on the same track as me, Michael, you're, with that. You're <laughs> preaching to the choir right yes. now, Caitlin. Yeah. yeah. No, like it's, that's the, I, the, that's the reason why you do the long run is that it's right. long and yeah. that it's stimulating certain systems and yeah, the, the the big question, what's the purpose of this run? Right. And if you've altered the purpose of that run because you can't fit it in, I mean, I don't know what to say. It's uh, Change your priorities, man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> your your silly right, life with your family and your career. Come on. Running is what number about the marathon? one. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. The, the ugly truth is, is that is the case for a lot of people. It's like, it is number one, but I can't make it number one. But how do I make it number one? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I mean, it, that's the big ask of marathon running and particularly goal or time-based marathon running. You know, it's going to be a commitment of a certain number of hours a week. Uh, all the, you know, there's a, there's a lot of plans out there that will tell you you can get away with things. The truth is, is that most of them are lying to you so that you buy something or that or you, or you, you believe in what they're trying to say, so you give them attention. Uh, the truth is, is that marathon running takes a lot. Even at the most basic level, it takes a big commitment. So, but skip the breath work; you'll be fine. <laughs> don't, but don't, don't skip that uh, that nighttime routine, though. Right? Got to yep. get your eight, your Sleep. eight and a half hours in. Yep. So, guys, speaking of mistakes, I'm curious. Biggest long run fails. I I, I want to hear it. Uh, Alex, if, um, you've done some long runs in your day. You've done quite a few long runs in your day. Uh, you've done some big, some big volume, some big mileage. Uh, do you have a, uh, do you got, an, do you have an ugly long run story? I do. And it's almost more embarrassing because this is a total group failure. We were 15. We were, this was in college. I was in my fourth year. So I'm about 21 years old at this point. We were south of our university. University was in Nova Scotia. We were in Maine, so the northernmost state other than Alaska. And we had raced there on Saturday, woke up the next day, Sunday, and we were on a tight schedule because our bus driver had to be somewhere else. He had to pick up another team from another place in Canada. So we had about two hours to, to complete our long run. And then we had to get on the bus and leave. Two hours was fine. I think most of us were doing 100 minutes. So an hour 40. So we take off from the hotel and we're in Bangor, Maine, which is, which is one of Maine's biggest cities, but it's still pretty rural. It's not a grid whatsoever. It's, it's more of a weird web with no rhyme or reason to its streets. 
So we take off and we never really leave the, the, the outer bounds of Bangor. We're, we're running through the city, but at one point, I think we get to a bit east of it. And we all look at each other and realize that none of us actually knows how to get back to the hotel. We also <laughs> don't have our phones. This is before the fancy watches that could make calls. We have Garmin's and we know our pace. We know our time, but we can't communicate with anybody. We don't know people's numbers by heart because numbers are saved in phones now. So we don't know how to get back and we don't know who to call. So we start to try to just make our way back to the hotel, but nothing's making sense. And at one point we're getting close to those two hours. So we're getting a bit nervous because we're no, we know we're screwing the bus driver over. And so we split up, stupid decision, to try to find this hotel. And eventually one of our groups looks up and here comes the bus the bus driver had taken matters into his own hands and he, he went off to collect all of us from, from the streets of Bangor because he had a job to do. So he picked up this first group and then put them on the bus and it just became a chase around Maine for the bus to find all of us. So eventually he got us on the bus. We're not showered. We don't have our stuff. So we go back to the hotel, pick up our stuff and go. I still don't know if the bus driver made it on time. But yeah, we... Before backpack to, or track back. It, Right. <laughs> yeah. A GPS would have been nice yeah. anyway. Yeah. <laughs> hmm. Caitlin, uh, have you, um, I guess for you, you can't really, getting lost would be kind of a dangerous thing running in the jungle. Like yeah. what's the, what's uh, the, what's the big mistake? I think, you know, my mistake isn't that interesting, but I think it's helpful. I think that sometimes I'm overly confident and think I don't need that much fueling. I don't need ah. more than a liter and a half of water if I'm going to be gone for a few hours in the heat and the humidity. Yes, I did need that water. Yes, I did need that food. Um, and every time. So I think like overconfidence is something that's, um, that, that gets to me every once in a while. And I think, yeah, but it's just a couple of hours. You know, what could I possibly need? Uh, a lot, you know, calories and electrolytes and fluid. So um, I think there's not just one big disaster, but many small disasters of where I've just bonked on a long run and it was completely unnecessary. God, you're getting me, getting me worried about my little, my little uh, 80 kilometer <laughs> jog through the wilderness <laughs> on Friday. Bring my, food. <laughs> I, I'm, yeah, I've got like a little flask that can uh, filter the, the river water and I bought an entire like skid like crate of morton uh fluid and i bought a whole bunch of bars so okay, uh, good. i'm gonna like pack i'm gonna pack a sandwich i need to eat a real meal at some point i can't yeah i can't oh no 80k you need to have solid food. food you have to yeah you have to have otherwise your tummy's just gonna revolt on you yep. yeah yeah so for me <laughs> i was trying to like um i was trying to whittle it down <laughs> oh boy <laughs> Oh, no. I've made so many friggin' mistakes in the long run over the years. Um, and it's good because you learn from those mistakes, right? I I have gotten horribly lost, which has led me to my first ultra running experiences, right? Where you're like <laughs> you're like you go out to do 34k and you end up you end up at the 50k mark at the end oh of it. Oh my god. Um, yeah, I've done that one. Uh I've had to call my wife to come pick me up just because I'm like, I'm just I've buried myself and it's august on the country road and i'm i'm 28k deep and i've done a whole huge chunk of marathon pace and it's just caught up to me and like i'm staggering and i'm like totally bonked and i'm i need to be scooped up and and taken home <laughs> um i've done that one i once i was once doing a long run out in the countryside again in the middle of the summertime super duper hot don't bring any fluids with me at all. And I was okay. I'm a big sweater. So I was, you know, I was a little worried, but I was okay. I was going to make it back fine. It's the guy I was with was falling apart and he just kept having to stop and walk. And we're in the middle of nowhere. And then eventually like, and we're like very rural Canada. And like, eventually there was um, a woman in this, like, you know, this little house in the middle of nowhere. And she saw us walking and then she ran out on the road and she had two like ice cold bottles of water and gave them to oh. us. And I'm just like, I'm drinking it. Like it's been, you know, 70 days in the desert or whatever. And, uh, 
and my and it I basically it it's it saved my pal. I mean, he was like he totally rallied after that, and we made it back and. You know, it's pretty good long run, all things considered, uh, and, uh, tough recovery the next day, but like, <laughs> yeah, these like basic mistakes you make where you, you overestimate, um, under prepare that sort of thing. Um, yeah. So, I mean, those, the classic mistakes, everyone's going to go through them. It's like a rite of passage in marathon training to make a few of these along the way, even when you're a pretty experienced runner, right. Is that you're going to screw up from time to time. <laughs> And you just make, make a little mental note, like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, you know, like maybe it feels dorky to bring the, the water bottle with you, but if it's like, you know, a hundred degrees outside and you're trying to fit your long run in on a Sunday, then, uh, maybe it's a good idea to carry that with you or like stash a bottle. That's my move is like, I'll run out, say if it's a 30 K long run or 21, 20 mile long run, I'll run out and back 16 K one way 16 K back and I'll drop a, I'll drink a little bit of a bottle and drop it about like, uh, you know, eight K out so mm -hmm. that I can catch it on the way back to, um, I'll just put it in the ditch or something like that. If you're in the middle of nowhere, um, or hide it somewhere, hide it somewhere strategically in the city. So, uh, you know, you <laughs> we had the same, we had the same strategy in university, except it wasn't a water bottle. We ditch. It was a teammate. He didn't want to do the long runs on Sundays, so we leave in about 2K. We'd put him in the ditch, and he'd wait for us and then show up on the way back because our coach was waiting for us. <laughs> no, <laughs> I don't believe you. That's terrible. Are you serious? <laughs> it works. Yeah. He's only cheating himself, Alex. Um, so do you? last question for you to kind of round out this kind of complete workshop on the long run. <laughs> do you do do you guys do long runs on time or distance and and like what's what's your take on the on on i doing one or the other i think for marathon running for the most part i mean a very beginner i think working with time helps a lot because you don't want to do you don't want to be spend too much time on your feet so if you're a beginner you may want to use time for long runs to not kind of go over that threshold or that um hit that upper limit but for anyone who's a little bit more experienced at all with marathons, I would definitely use mileage or I like using mileage, at least for the long run. Stuff during the week, recoveries and stuff can be time-based. But long runs, I like using mileage because I really just know and I can gauge where I am at. And um, But if you're mountain running, which I know we're not talking about today, but it's important just to mention it, trail running is almost always time, especially if you're in, I mean, in the kind of terrain and the hills and the mountains and steep uphills and you're walking and you just don't know how much ground you're going to possibly cover. So I think for long runs and trail running, you're going to use time. And for long runs in marathon running, you're probably going to use uh, mileage unless you're a beginner. What do you guys, what do you guys think? What do you do? Mm. Well, I'm kind of the opposite because many of my runs are on the flat pavement. So it becomes enticing to go quickly, even if the mandate is to go slowly. So for that, I've gravitated towards time over distance and I've, oh. I've flip flopped a lot in the past, but I just find this is just how my brain works. If you go for a hundred minutes, there's no, Oh, I wonder how quickly I can do this. As opposed to if you have 20 kilometers or 24 kilometers on the docket, you start playing games with yourself sometimes halfway through the run of, Hey, can I do 24 K in this time? Because last time I did it in this time. And even if you're not overtly trying to beat your long run time, which is ridiculous, which is not what you should try to do. You get into those little challenges. And so I found that just going with time is the best way to prevent against that. It's like a little guardrail because I truly don't care what pace I'm going. If I have to run a hundred, a hundred minutes, no matter what. Yeah. Anyway, you have to run it anyway. Ah, oh, that's, that's a really good point. Yeah. That actually aligns with, I would say my single biggest philosophical stance and running which is when you're doing the work don't get emotional about it especially the long run and the easy runs like don't get emotional about what you're doing because when you get emotional and you want to emotionally engage with it because it's boring because you're tired it's it's to overcompensate for something that is you know ch mentally challenging being really tired being fatigued because it's been a long week or maybe you didn't sleep very well or work stressing you out kind of weighs heavy on you and a way to counter that, which I think is a bad idea is to get too emotionally engaged with the run and to start challenging yourself and, uh, to 
start running faster, to race somebody who passes you on the trail <laughs> or whatever, right? All these sort of stupid clowny moves. And then obviously in a long run or in a, a run where you're like, exactly, Alex, it's like, how fast can I run 20 miles in? It's like, well, yeah, of course you can run 20 miles at like your marathon pace in theory, but then that requires more recovery, which you're probably going to not allow yourself because as an A-type person, you're going to then want to get up the next day and hit that mileage or that number that you want to hit. And then you start burying yourself. And then there's the magical, I got injured and I don't know why I got injured. It's like, well, I got injured because you were doing that stuff. And uh, you got to guard yourself against yourself in some respects, right? Um, so that, I do it, I do a combo. I do, to protect myself from what I just described there, I do a little check-in with like both time and distance. So at the beginning of the season, I'll run on time. And in fact, like I program that in where it's like, today I'm running 72 minutes or whatever. Um, and I also have a rough understanding of how long, how much distance that's going to, that should be more or less. And I get upset with myself if I was a little too peppy in that run and I've got more mileage on the clock or on the watch than I should. And so for a long run, the same thing goes. I think in terms of both both distance and time, it's convenient when you are dialed in and you've got a time goal and it aligns really nicely with, say, two hours 30, two hours 35, two hours 40 is also sort of fallen into that 20 mile long run kind of area and makes life pretty easy. So I, I, I acknowledge that it's uh, pretty straightforward for me, but it's basically the kind of calculus I do. I'm like, okay, I got to run. I got to be on my feet for about two and a half hours and I want to kind of hit around whatever, 30 or 32 kilometers or something like that. And that's, that's what I focus on. So I think it's a, I think you can use both. Yeah. I, I I think we're, sounds like we're both kind of, all three of us are kind of using both. Yeah, so, definitely. Yeah. All right. I think we've, I think we've covered the, the long run in, in great yeah. detail. Yeah. And if, you know, obviously if anyone has any questions or thoughts or comments or wants to learn more, I mean, first of all, the site's got a ton of resources. We've got a plan for like every single time goal and just finishing as well for every distance, including, including ultras, but yeah certainly marathons we're mm -hmm. guys we're marathon handbook right <laughs> so uh we're trying to be the handbook here so it's quite thorough and a little teaser for uh for those listening um we're working on a, a video series caitlin is going to be piloting where she's going to walk everyone through each one of these time-based goals and distances it's a big project it's going to yep. take us some time to get it done but it's in the works right now where it's like these these really in-depth training guides for how to how to nail like say sub four hour marathon, sub three hour marathon, uh that sort of thing. So yeah. keep an eye out on our YouTube channel for that. Subscribe to our YouTube channel because Alex is making awesome stuff on a weekly basis. Got what do you got coming? We've got the Huberman thing coming out, which we've already talked in depth about. And you've got next week what's what's loaded in the chamber, Alex? We have a review of one of the most storied and established training shoes in history, the A6 Nimbus 26. So I tested Ooh. it out, and it's actually been my my good friend in my uh, return from injury. It's a very – it's not a stability shoe, but it's a stable shoe, and it's a very cushioned shoe. And anyway, I go into that next week, and soon enough – We'll be revealing our top five super shoes of 2024 so far. Yes. And that was hard, right. man. That was hard to <laughs> narrow down. I am ones. confident in my picks. Yes. Okay. And nice. you've tested a lot of super shoes. So. Yes. To the point of probably getting injured. So I do it for you, <laughs> dear listeners. And so, viewers. So do Alex a solid and subscribe to our YouTube <laughs> channel and watch all the videos. And we've got a newsletter that goes out five days a week. Caitlin is one of the authors of that newsletter yep. um, and jammed with great stuff. Rate and subscribe. If you don't already subscribe to the podcast, what are you doing? Listen as far into the podcast. Come on, subscribe <laughs> to the podcast and give us a review. Give us the five stars and uh, feel free to write a review as well. It goes, it goes a crazy long way. It tickles the algorithms on the, the podcasting platform. So please do that one. <laughs> 
<laughs> and uh, yeah, so that's it for this week, guys. And we will talk to you next week. Happy running. <laughs>